Hello. Uh, first, I want to say that this is really incredible. Uh, and secondly, apologize for all of the uh, names that are about to happen. It's a lot. Um, but you get a break for the very beginning of the talk, um, because I just want to start and not talk for a second, because uh, we're about to talk about this woman, and this moment can't happen again. Um, so I just want you to look at the work, think about its painting, the quality, and the person you're seeing, and kind of form some opinions about that. And then we're gonna, and then we will chat about her more. Yeah, better? Cool. All right, so check her out. Great. So this is uh, Barbara Van Beck, born uh, Barbara Ursulin in 1629 in Osberg, Germany. Uh, she has a condition called Abram syndrome. Her parents did not have this condition. When you're born, you already have hair all over. So I'm assuming it was quite a surprise. These people were still interested in money though, and so by the age of 10, she was already on public display. And that would be her career for her whole life. Um, she would travel and uh, basically present herself as an oddity and a curiosity. So by 26, she married uh, Michael Van Beck, where she gets that last name. Uh, by all accounts, um, he was as interested in uh, managing her career as he was in loving her. Uh, and they still had a child, um, and sh the daughter did not have uh, the syndrome. But beyond that, she um, basically traveled, played the virginal, was a wit. She had a lot of, uh, she spoke several different languages, and her performance was being a normal person. <laughs> uh, it was pretty incredible, um, and it actually gave her a lot of autonomy. That said, she was still displaying herself for entertainment. So you get statements like this from John, Bullfit, Bo John Bullfinch, an artist and engraver. This woman I saw in Radcliffe Highway in the year of 1668, and I was satisfied that she was a woman. We can all agree that he paid extra to see her vagina. Like, that's, that's what <laughs> happened. I am positive. But yeah. So as, but as we look at all of these works, we see her in very contemporary, very stylish dresses, often uh, shown with her instrument um, and shown with a lot of humanity. Her eyes meet the viewer directly um, and she is a person. Uh, I really like the way that uh, Dr. Angela McShane, a research development manager at the Welcome Collection put it, while Barbara was certainly a celebrity because of her condition, she was able to live well, to travel, and to make a good living from meeting people who were as much interested, or who were as much in awe of her condition and her intelligence as they were in the wonders of God's world. So I want to contrast that pretty sharply with some of the other people who have come into public life uh, with Abram syndrome. Uh, starting with the Gonzalez family, which were the first uh, people with this condition kind of known in modern history. Um, so the father, Pedro Gonzalez, was found in the Canary Islands. He had several children who all had the condition, and they were basically kept as noble savages uh, amongst the royal courts throughout Europe. When you first look at this painting of one of his daughters, Aneta uh, looks very similar to the painting we looked at at the beginning of the talk. Um, but the inscription really tells a slightly different story. Uh, Don Pietro, a wild man discovered in the Canary Islands, was conveyed to his most sincere highness, Henry, the King of France, and from there came to his excellency, the Duke of Parma. From whom came I, Antonetta, and now I can be found, and it goes through a list of several other royal families that she was kind of passed around between. And it seems like this very curious condition um, kind of brings people into a certain kind of limelight. So there have been fewer than 50 cases of Abrams documented worldwide since the 16th century. Many of them have become performers. This is uh, Alice Elizabeth Doherty, who's the only native-born uh, person of the United States with the condition. Um, and then you get uh, this woman, Julia Pastor uh, Pastorina, otherwise known as the nondescript. And this, there's a lot of strange connections in this talk to our previous ones. This is actually uh, her preserved body. Uh, people were so interested in her that they kept her around after death. Um, then you, of course, had, uh, uh, what is, we've got a, sorry, Lionel the lion-faced man, Jojo the dog-faced boy, and uh, most recently, uh, Jesus uh, Alcrecives, uh, the wolf man who is currently performing in the uh, Terror House in London, 
they actually, the BBC made a documentary about him. He shaved his face to try and have a more normal life and uh, found that the Terror House paid him a lot more and grew it all back. <laughs> um, another uh, person with it is this uh, young girl in Thailand named uh, Supatra Sufan, um, who has largely kind of escaped the limelight except for getting Guinness World Records uh, Hairiest Girl Award. But otherwise, she seems to have a really normal life. So I want to circle back to that first painting um, and kind of look at it again. Now kind of knowing a bit of the biography of the person who is displayed, kind of think about how that work has changed. Um, I really like this example. Uh, this is a, a painting of a person who's very famous for doing self-portraits, Van Gogh. John Berger uh, put it this way. It's hard to define exactly how the words have changed the image, but undoubtedly they have. Um, similar in portraiture, if we look at these two photos, they're basically the same, right? <laughs> two dudes with beards in the late 1860s. But we've got one has like the weight of American history on top of him, and that's how we see him. And that's why, let's face it, portrait galleries are typically very boring. Because it's just a bunch of faces, and you're like, meh, who cares? But then, like uh, seeing a person that you know in a crowd, you're like, I know that person! That's exciting! Um, and you're drawn to those. And these little bits of biography help us understand uh, the people that we're seeing. And in fact, in all of these talks, we largely use a lot of portraiture to um, illustrate the biographies we're talking about. Um, but I do want to talk shortly about like, why portraits happen, because it's very rare that we actually like, why does art happen? <laughs> art. Uh, but so if we look at the tradition of portraiture from like, basically the Renaissance through 1885 when the camera was invented, um, there was a couple of primary reasons why it was happening. Uh, so first of all, we all remember this asshole. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, King George III. So this is like kind of the first reason. This is a Reginald portrait. Like all of his, this is from his coronation. All of the stations of kinghood are there. He does not look at the viewer. He looks above the viewer. This would be in palaces. And works like this would also be in like state buildings to be a placeholder for power. We still do this. Um, like with the president, pictures of the president. The queen still hangs out in Canada on all sorts of buildings. Anyway. Next we get uh, the status portrait. Here we have Kenneth Sutherland III in full hunting regalia on his lands, ready to kill a fox. Um, and this is really just talks about status. It's his land, he's got some fancy clothes, he's got a gun, it's cool. Um, and that's the only reason it was painted. And then finally, you get works uh, with a little bit more personality that would typically be self-portraits, portraits of friends and lovers that you do kind of to practice. I, I take it a few of you have, have seen this work. Um, so continuing to look at self-portrait, the, the people who are most kind about talking about portraiture uh, talk about it as a collaboration between the sitter and uh, the painter, trying to show some essential truth about that person. So looking at Rembrandt, um, two self-portraits done by the same person in the same hand, one's 1635, one's 1659, uh, you see very distinct difference. You see a biography that's happened. You see a person that's lived and has a different perspective on life. Uh, direct, I, I really like this. Uh, the sound of a person's voice is what's best captured in a portrait. Uh, that's uh, from the director of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. <laughs> Otherwise, it was a very boring video. I don't recommend watching. <laughs> but it's a great pull quote. Um, so when we think about that kind of like essential piece of self and like this most generous presentation of portraiture, and we look back at this image, I, I don't know that it's a portrait. It serves to other uh, rather than show some piece of a person. Whereas we look at this one, and I'm kind of like, yeah, this is a very human moment. It's a very touching thing, which is the same feeling I get from this. It's a painting of Barbara, her shoulders slightly slack in a fashionable dress, looking out at us trying to do much what her act did, prove that she's a normal person. Um, so I'd like to raise a glass to uh, being curious about one another and to Barbara. This painting was recently acquired by the Welcome Connect Collection, uh, so, and it, uh, artist unknown, but uh, interesting. 